Oh boy. Hi. Um, here we are again. It's nine o'clock on uh, Wednesday night. Uh, back to normal weeks. So I'm back to being a homeschooling dad, which is, uh, you know, slightly distracting. Uh, but anyway, that's the way it is. So here we are in the virology studio. And I'm going to take you for a short... I've just realized I've never taken you on a tour of my studio. I mean, that just seems unreasonable. So fortunately, it won't take long. It's a very small studio. But um, anyway, here goes. So um, I am, I don't know if you know, uh, well, I'm sure you know, I have a past in virology, specifically genetics. Um, and, you know, molecular biology was my training. So, so basically, you know, that comes through in my, in my art. Um, you know, kind of subconsciously, I never realized it at first. In fact, I'll say this much. My plan as an as an when I when I left science in two thousand eight, my plan was to absolutely just give up on the whole idea of science. I wanted nothing more to do with it. To be totally honest with you, and what happened, um, you know, so I would go about the streets of Sydney with my colourful paints and set up my easel and just start painting what I saw. Um, trying to forget, like literally trying to get the idea of ideas out of my head, stop thinking so much and just try and come to terms with this uh, thing of color and line. And I didn't really know why I was doing it. I just was compelled to do it. But after a few years of that, um, for some reason, not really sure why. In fact, I remember, I, I remember, remember quite clearly the specific moment I was, um, talking to my lovely wife, Galia, on the, sitting in the studio doodling. I was literally doodling. And I remember looking down at the, at the doodle, and I, I was surprised to see that, that um, in the doodle were all these ideas, and they were all ideas that were about science, were about ideas, and they were about how the way I used to see the world as a, as a, as a child, as a 10, 12, 14 your old boy, and it was an amazing time of getting to know myself, really. And it was a really kind of, and I, and I loved that time, and I loved those ideas. They were incredibly intimate to me. And, you know, it was around that time, I remember at school, once getting this, um, being given this, it was in biology class, and being given this picture, I was given a, uh, there was a textbook. We were learning about development, and I couldn't, get my head around it. And my biology teacher at the time gave me this drawing, this picture from a textbook of an embryo of a human, a fish, and a chicken. <laughs> and I'm only laughing now because I've suddenly realized uh, in my art today, I'm obsessed with fish and chicken. And I wonder if it has something to do with that. People always say, why why fish and chicken? And I say, well, I don't know. It's a, It's a metaphor for... And I don't like to over, you know, over explain or I don't even necessarily know exactly why I'm drawn to those symbols. Um, you, you may remember this chicken from uh, the uh, biology studio, the virology studio yesterday, my wiry chicken. So there's an example of a chicken. Um, uh, that wire thing is a chicken. Now, uh, but what struck me about that diagram was how uh, incredibly similar the fish the chicken and the human embryo were to each other. They were almost indistinguishable. And that was such a mind, mind blowing moment for me uh, because I, I just realized in that moment that, uh, you know, what was presented to us in, 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 in our regular life, you know, in our relatively conservative schooling systems, in our extremely conservative religious uh, institutions, somehow had nothing to do with what was actually out there, what was actually the truth. And, and I, I, you know, I made it my, I think I was 13 or 14 at the time, I made it my absolute um, purpose in life to try and understand what these origins were, because clearly what, what the world that we saw in front of us was not what it is. And, and I found that extremely, um, I don't know if the word is gratifying, but... but um, it gave me so much meaning and purpose in my life, um, you know, and it was a profound moment. And that's what drew me to science. That's why I wanted to go into science. And, and that's what I did do. So I went into science. But, you know, I think what happened was 
Uh, I worked in science for many years, like about 10 years or so. Please don't ask me for exact dates, but lecturing, doing my PhD, studying viruses and bacteria. And I think I just burnt myself out, to be totally honest. There were a couple of things that, that, um, that drew me away from science. And I, I think, to be honest, if I'm going to be totally honest, and why the hell not? Um, I, I became disillusioned because of the actual, the actual doing of science became, um, I guess, not, not how I imagined it to be. Uh, and this is going to be quite amusing. I, I imagined uh, I used to walk around in, on, on the, uh, you know, as an undergraduate with, with friends discussing these amazing ideas of science. And I thought that's what my life as a scientist would be like. I'd, I'd, I'd go into a laboratory and I'd... I'd quite quickly solve some extraordinary um, problems of, of, of science. And I actually remember very clearly when I graduated and I went into my honours year uh, at Pretoria University, um, you know, full of, of the zest that, that makes you want to be a scientist. And, you know, I had this, I was given this assignment, this project to, in those days, was to clone a gene from a virus. It was, uh, they'd got some viral... Um, genetic material and they wanted to clone it and they thought it'd be a useful good honors project. And I remember talking to the master's student, this guy Frank, who I had, it was like hero worship, you know, I thought he was just the most incredible, um, the most incredible, you know, he was like a god to me, like, you know, he has a, doing his master's in science and and he'd been doing it for two years and I said to him, well, what are you, what are you doing for your master's? He said, so he tells me he's trying to clone this gene. So I thought, really? Um, You've been doing this for two years and you're trying to clone a gene. Surely that would take you like a couple of days. You clone the gene, discover something amazing about it, publish these results in, a, in an amazing journal. And, you know, just that's that. But you've been doing this for two years. And I think it was in that moment I realized this is going to be quite a journey. And, and, and you know, this is why I have such an, ins you know, and, and I went through this journey till the level of um, master's, PhD, uh, lecturing and, 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 and loving a lot of it. But actually, finally, just realizing that I had, it had got the best of me. I, I was by the time I left science, I was, I was, um, yeah, I was. Uh, I think I was tired, to be honest. But I was also along the way drawn to art along the way. And I think what what happened, you know, uh, one of the one of the things that happens, or well, that happened to me in science, is is that the romance of science didn't match up with the actual doing of science. And I think that had a lot to do possibly my personality, but I also think what's happened, what's happening in the, in the sciences and maybe even, um, it, you know, is that science has become incredibly, certainly in my field, and, and this is not the case in all fields, but in, in my field, very technologically driven. Um, so so you'd, you'd, your questions would often be... Um, to some extent, influenced, I won't say dictated by the technology at hand, but very strongly influenced by it. So I felt like we weren't delving into that mystery that I found so profoundly intriguing as a young, as a young person. I'd lost my contact with that mystery. And I was talking to an artist friend of mine today, and you know, she was saying to me, when she feels a bit lost along the way, uh, she tries to tap into those things that she experienced as a child which made her want to, um, which would bring her back to her art practice. And I thought that's kind of how I felt in science. I wasn't able to, I wasn't getting that from my life as a scientist. And I think that's what drew me to art. But now, so this is, this is the profound thing. Um, so then I, I became this full-time artist uh, for, several year, for several years. And, and um, after about three or four years of, you know, painting and experiencing colors and, 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 you know, learning this whole new thing, I discovered science through drawing. I just accidentally, subconsciously, this resurfaced. And it gave me this profound new appreciation for what it was about science that I loved so much. And, 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 and still to this day, what absolutely drives my intense, my intense passion to bring artists and scientists together in some way. Because I got a renewed love for what science is and trying to do through art, which is, a, it sounds incredibly paradoxical. But I don't even think it is paradoxical, paradoxical because um, 
one thing about artists and scientists, they're incredibly human activities. You know, we are, you know, they're the ultimate human activities where we are trying to find meaning and purpose in life. Yeah, there, there are probably others. And I imagine uh, if, if, if religion, you're drawn to religion, um, I guess that would be another area where you could get profound um, um, meaning in your life, you know. Uh, but I, for some reason, wasn't drawn in that, in that direction. Um, I was drawn into that needing to find it, but somehow something that was connected to the material, the world that I lived in. And for me, that seemed to be through art. And, and, and so what's, what's happened now is that I've just really become sort of full circle where I'm working a lot with scientists here in Sydney and trying to bring other artists, very different kind of artists, just close together with scientists to see what happens when you do that. My art now is very influenced by, you, you can tell I'm a molecular biologist because um, the art I make is all about um, repetitive ideas. Like one thing about genetics, mutations, we can think about viruses as well. These are elements where the idea of repetition is so profoundly um, integrated into, into the way they are. And it's not just repetition, it's that the repetition is irregular, not perfect. Those are the mutations we were talking about the other day. If repetition was absolutely perfect, every one of these building blocks, which I'm showing you over here, would be exactly the same. But they're not. And this is a very genetic idea. Those variations lead to profound and interesting and unexpected results. And if you've got selection thrown in there, you get novel uh, properties of any living system. Repetition also happens in time. So these, that's repetition in space. Repetition are processes that repeat in time, like machines. And I make these machines, which I call wobbly machines. Uh, you know, I, I, I think I showed you this one the other day, a very simple one. But it's the idea that there's a wobble, that there's a repetition, and that repetition introduces imperfections, irregularities, which are absolutely the stuff of life. So that just almost subconsciously emerged in my art making practice and, and uh, has made me the, the, the artist I am today. Um, now, that, you know, I wasn't going to take you for a tour of the studio, but I sort of felt like it was. You know, let's get away a little bit from um, COVID-19 for, for, a, for a short while. Not that it's of any less importance, but I think it's really important to get, go into the bigger picture, go into the context. And, and um, a friend of mine on Facebook, um, I won't mention your name, Hannah, <laughs> but, but said to me, you know, said a really profound thing to me. She said, we presented with a lot of facts out there, okay, a lot of... Um, We've shown a lot of facts about the world we live in uh, uh, from science. And it doesn't, you know, that's, that's really important. But actually, it's, you know, it, it doesn't give us the bigger picture. It doesn't give, you an, give us an, an appreciation. They're just thrown about as if they're just easy to come by. There's no history. There's no context to them. So what I really wanted to do was um, just spend a little bit of time talking about that context um, from, from my experience and from the, re the reading I've done. Now, um, that sort of takes me to, you know, and I guess what is the conceptual frameworks in which science happens? You know, this, this goes back a long way. So, so, you know, I'm not going to go back too far, but I, uh, I'll take you back as far as where I feel um, the story makes, makes some sense to me. But about 120 years ago or something, you know, it, the physicists of the day, um, the, the philosophers of the day had a profound, and that was always the case. Remember, science is a nat was always a natural philosophy, okay? It's not so much a philosophy today. It was always a natural philosophy. But that philosophy has fallen by the wayside, and I think that, is, that has profound implications. So, uh, but I'm going to just go back 120 or so years ago, um, where uh, the philosophy of the day was... Um, well, just prior to that, people like were just starting to understand this idea of atoms, like particles, like very small uh, particles that make up bigger things. Very much the kind of work you're seeing in my studio, the, the idea of very small things making up very big things. And, you know, we get a profound appreciation of that in our life where, um, you know, we have very small things that have profound impacts on us, like viruses. 
But before that, they were just starting to understand how um, atom-like things. They'd never seen an atom. They didn't understand anything about the structure of an atom, but they, uh, the structure of an atom. But they could assume there must be these things called atoms because of scientists like Boltzmann. He was an absolute hero of mine, a physicist who came up, um, started to understand how it is that tiny, tiny little things that we can't see, that by acting in large uh, aggregates can have um, outcomes like temperature and pressure and all these um, properties that we feel and experience in, the, in, in our day-to-day -day world can be caused by tiny little things that I think they may have been calling them atoms at the time, but it doesn't really matter. By tiny little things running around, bumping into each other, bumping into the surface of containers, that's how the world, that's the model of the world that he was starting to develop. But then a philosopher, a very influential philosopher, and I think his name was Mach, uh, M-A-C-H, Franz Mach, um, came along, and this is the profound effect of a philosophy, what that philosophy can have on the day. He became a very influential philosopher, and he said, if you can't see the thing, you cannot, you must assume that it is not there. We should only um, believe or, or claim to be real what we can see or what we can, what we can somehow observe. Because we couldn't observe those atoms and things, we must assume that that is an incorrect, they do not exist. I think he went so far as to say that, which these days seems possibly absurd. Um, and as a result, these incredible ideas of people like Boltzmann were disregarded, okay? So you can see how just the philosophy of the day has a profound effect on the way that science can develop, on the, the way that science can tell its stories, that it can bring meaning to the world we live in. Now, that was then. Now, about 100 years ago, along came uh, people of the likes of uh, Max Planck, uh, Niels Bohr, um, Max Born, uh, these were the people who developed the, um, the science of quantum mechanics. Now, I know, I see Matthew Broom is, 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 uh, is there, behind there. I think you're there, Matt. Uh, if, if a brilliant quantum mechanic, uh, mechanist, what do you call yourself? A quantum mechanic? I don't know. He's a physicist, all right? That's what he is, is a physicist. Now, what happened with that science and, um, was that the predictions it was making although extremely um, accurate and effective, couldn't be explained. They could not be explained in our regular language. They came up with ideas like, um, you know, the very famous one being that, um, you know, a particle cannot, it cannot be measured, um, its position and, and momentum cannot be measured simultaneously. So we can't know everything about it. It was simply physically impossible. Not because we weren't good at measuring things, but simply it was mathematical, mathematically or physically impossible for it to be done. Quantum physicists, that's what you are. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> so, you know, um, and there were ideas around um, a causality, like you don't have to have something causing something else. These were ideas that were emerging in quantum physics. physics. People like Einstein thought that didn't sound right at all. Uh, he famously said, God doesn't play dice with the universe. But the quant, the, 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 um, the, what's the word? The, the um, result of all of that, the, um, the consequence of all of that is that physicists no longer felt they needed philosophers because philosophers couldn't tell them anything about what they were doing. They could predict things. They couldn't explain things. And they decided as a result, there was some kind of split starting to happen that we don't need explanation. We, we already have prediction. We have uh, a way of measuring our world very accurately, if, if not perfectly. Uh, we must remember prior to this time, well prior, um, Sir Isaac Newton came up with a profound theory of um, classical mechanics, which essentially said, Everything is deterministic. Everything can be measured. If you know the particle, the position of a particle at this point in time and space, you can, if you had a fancy enough computer and you could observe everything that was going on, observe and predict everything in the future from this moment forth. Okay, so that's what he said. Quantum physics came along and said that's not the case. And on top of that, it said we have no room now for the philosopher 
because the philosophers can't, we, we can't explain it, but we can predict. And maybe that is just going to have to be good enough. So, as a result of that, um, there was a bit of a breach between science and the humanities, all right? Science went off and did its thing, and the humanities went off and did its thing. And they kind of lost path. They lost, they lost track of each other. And for me, um, I think, you know, that this kind of malaise about science that we're experiencing today has a lot to do with the fact that scientists have essentially gone off in their own direction. I, being a geneticist, shouldn't necessarily have been fallen foul to the same thing, but I think it's just permeated the nature of science. So um, I think it's just the nature of where we're at right now. We have scientists who's, who are doing their own thing, and then the whole rest of the humanities and, and the arts are doing their thing, okay? So I think the breach came about because there was just, didn't seem to be a need for the, uh, for the philosopher, for, the, uh, for, for understanding, for being able to really understand that deep mystery. Not even a need, I think they gave up on the possibility of it happening. And I'd love somebody to kind of challenge me on that. But, um, but, but I think what's happened now and, and, and what's really important is that um, we need to bridge those divides because ultimately science is part of our human experience. It's a profound part of our human experience. And I think scientists have a lot that they can teach us about being human, about what and who we are in the world. And, and, and it's really important that that's, that that happens more. And I think it is starting to happen. But that is kind of where we need to go. And, and I thought just quickly I'd share just a couple of things which touch on uh, that experience of, of, us, of, of science and humanity. We can go back to, to um, Louis Pasteur, you know, very famous for... Um, it's Louis Pasteur is very famous for you know doing pasteurization, inventing pasteurization, and also some of the early vaccination studies. Now, he lived at a time, and this is all about how science is part of culture and how it's influenced. Even the ideas that it has are so much a part of culture. Now, what happened with him was he um, was apparently a hardened. Um, royalist. He did not like socialism at all. He was very hardline to the right, uh, the right wing. And I wonder if they called it the right wing back then. I'm not sure. It was in the 1870s. Am I right? Uh, maybe a bit earlier. No, around then, I think. Everything seemed to happen around the 1870s. What is that all about? Anyway, the point is he saw the world and he understood this idea of germ theory. All right. And it was never believed before that, that just prior to his ideas, the thought that a microbe, a tiny little bacteria, could cause disease in a human being by growing out of control. It was absurd. Uh, it didn't make any sense. It was not accepted at all. He was the one to demonstrate that idea or, yeah, to come to go a long way towards demonstrating that idea. And actually, it came about because he was terrified of the masses, essentially, the masses of humanity uh, getting out of control and destroying the monarchy and, and overthrowing the government and, and losing control of things. Why was he worried about that? Because at that time in human evolution, in the evolution of civilizations, civilizations were uh, starting to become, um, were starting to burst. Like in Chicago, for example, it went from, in 1820, a thousand people, a swamp, and 60 years later, or even less, a population of a million. So there was an incredibly large population growth and it seemed there was not really the accommodation of the niches that maybe populations now occupy there was a lot of movement between the niches and 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 that was unsettling for somebody of his uh, social status shall we say so it's just really interesting how um you know he was worried about the uncontrolled growth of things and 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 gave him it gave him made it easy for him to arrive at his very profound germ theory of infection. Um, I got this, by the way, uh, you know, there's some beautiful old texts written by, by um, popular science writers, you know. Uh, this one, this is a funny story because when I was leaving my university, uh, on the last day I was there, I grabbed this book off the shelf. Uh, you know, it was in my office, I was allowed to, I think. Uh, 
the Faber Book of Science, and it had the story by David Badanus, Badanus, who's written a couple of other books. But this is the one, this is a short essay he wrote about um, Louis Pasteur, which I thought was really interesting. Um, you know, I wonder if it's worth telling you, there was, you know, just to add to the story of the cultural context and science and how it even pertains to these ideas of mutation and, uh, and viruses we were speaking about the other night, how virus mutations kind of a pr profound effect on their pathogenesis, potentially. Now, again, 200 years ago, when Darwin was around, those ideas were absurd. They were not acceptable. The fact that you can... Be, and the reason that, that it was not acceptable that you should have this rather probabilistic, randomized process of muta, muta, mutation um, and then selection of the fittest ones, so random, was not acceptable. And it was not acceptable for a couple of reasons. A, uh, it was around the time of... Um, so Newton had come not too far before that, and the world was very cozy in the idea of determinism, that everything has a cause and then has an effect, and one thing leads to another, and ultimately the idea of there's this idea of final cause, that we are moving towards this high idealized form of being human, all right? Uh, a theory called teleology, okay, that's teleology. A lot of these ideas I've got from this book which I'll show you, there's some, again, beautiful books written out there by this famous evolutionary biologist by the name of uh, Ernst Mayer. Uh, Ernst Mayer, he wrote a book called One Long Argument. He could have called it One Very Long Argument, uh, but a fantastic book. But, you know, he pointed to the fact that in those days before Darwin came along, and even Darwin didn't like the idea of natural selection because he was profoundly religious too, and he also believed that all change, if there is going to be change, it has to be moving towards this uh, perfection, the state of perfection, all right? So there was a great resistance to come to terms with the idea of randomized, probabilistic um, thinking uh, in what Darwin brought about to the modern world. Fantastically, uh, I wonder if just his way of seeing the world, even though I'm, you know, um, didn't in some way influence, make it a bit easier for the quantum physicists to come along and have ideas that were even more radical than that. Um, it's also interesting, again, because Darwin's theories came at a time when, um, you know, around the time of the Industrial Revolution, where capitalism was starting to get a foothold. So the idea of the, the catchphrase survival of the fittest, which is actually not the best term to describe natural selection, but it became the great phrase to give support to Darwin. And people loved it because it justified the way that capitalism operated in the world, you know, as a very powerful uh, way of growth, powerful vehicle for growth. Unfortunately, we're seeing the, 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 the brunt of this unbridled capitalism in our world now. And, you know, hopefully uh, some lessons to be learned from that. But um, I think that's, that was a really um, important idea. Uh, and again, it was in that time of, of capitalism that an idea of Darwin's could get a foothold. Or maybe his idea emerged because that economic system was starting to, um, to come about. There have been some other amazing theories, and, and I think would have taken us even in richer, uh, a richer way. Because the one problem with Darwin natural selection is it's kind of hard to prove. It's a bit circular, the argument. But where there, there are scientists like um, the great biologist Darcy Wentworth Thompson, I wish I had his book, I do have his book, but it's inside. Uh, you know, he, his ideas uh, were all about how, and I think uh, if anyone's a physicist out there, um, it's a more profound way of understanding um, living systems because it really looks at natural processes and form, the way waves move, the way... Uh, just the way uh, pressure and growth limits because of, um, you know, gravitational effects. This scientist or almost mathematically applied that to living systems. And that, you know, that didn't take as much because it was the wrong time and possibly the wrong place. But it would have a very, had a very profound outcome had those models of, of biology being adopted and not Darwinian models of adopt, of, of 
had been adopted. So it just goes to show there isn't a fundamental ultimate truth underneath us all. That's what makes science such an ultimately very, very human endeavor. Just a thing practiced by humans, not a perfect thing. So we go along a path and eventually we build it up to a certain point and it either continues or it breaks down at some point. Um, but that's why, that's the beauty of science. And it's also the beauty of art. Um, they have this, um, they're not perfect. Uh, I wanted to show you this. One last, very last thing. A friend of mine, a dear friend of mine sent me, we're doing, we did a, a painting swap. Uh, and I want to show you his work because it actually touches on something I said the other day. And, and I hope he doesn't mind me using it as a metaphor. Um, the artist's name is Carlos Barrios. He's a very prominent, uh, famous artist here in Sydney. Um, well, not in Sydney, actually, in Australia. Um, this is this beautiful piece that he sent me. I'll try and, it's hard to do it justice on an, an I, on a iPhone, like Carlos Barrios, all right? Remember that name if you don't know it. But now Carlos epitomizes, I think, that thing that viruses have. And of course, not in the horrible thing that viruses have, but in the beautiful thing that viruses have. Remember I said to you that viruses exist on a threshold. They, they are in a fine line of not being too ordered, not being too regular, but also not going over the edge into the world, into the realm of chaos. They exist on that very fine threshold. Like in this work, you know, any, any too many more changes to it will make it too noisy, will remove this perfect balance that it has and take it to a whole other place where it doesn't work. Viruses are like that. Any more mutations in these RNA viruses like mutations, any higher mutation rate, they fall apart. They cannot sustain themselves. They hit what's called error catastrophe. Now, notice the way Carlos has avoided error catastrophe just by, uh, you know, his pure, just deft, uh, you know, um, imagination and, and sense of balance. In this quite chaotic work, but it's highly, highly balanced. And I think that's a great metaphor for viruses. So on that note, that's what I wanted to say tonight. Um, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know how long I went on for. I, I just had this need to talk about things that were not the coronavirus. And even though I did touch on it slightly, I really thought it was important that we get the bigger picture here. We actually see the context in which science is practiced and the way it is really a profound human enterprise and one that we need to draw ourselves towards more and have and draw scientists more towards us in because they we all part of the same ultimately the same community so let's let's um strive for that i'm going to have a quick look to see what um if there are any questions that i should be uh answering uh remember you go, okay uh oh just nice comments that's always good um yeah um so yes that's all i want to say and it's really lovely to chat um so let's keep chatting and and if anyone has anything they'd like to me to uh chat about in the science context please feel free to to ask me uh really great to hang out take it easy good night